see us again. Good morning, Fahey. Viewers, I'm standing outside the home of Ken and Michelle Stromolich, which will be the host home of the 40s, 50s event coming this Saturday, January 28th. Now, they haven't given me the permission to be here. Jesus said, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. He can what? Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, it's a nice full room, good looking crowd. Come on, look around. You look good today, guys. This looks good. Tell somebody next to you, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, look at the person on the other side, your second choice. Tell them nice of you to show up. No, I'm just teasing. You don't have to do that. Just kidding. Hey, I want to welcome everybody that's joining us online too. Come on, Cherry Hill. Let's put our hands together for everybody that's part of this service with us on the other side of a screen. Man, good to see everybody today. And, uh, you know, Dave mentioned it a moment ago or alluded to it. If you're newer here and maybe it's your first time or first time in a while, you're our guest today. And we're just thrilled that you're with us and carved out part of your weekend to come and worship Jesus. We're thrilled about that. Uh, we are one church in two locations. We have a Glassboro campus and, of course, our Cherry Hill campus and many, many people that join us online every week too. So just thrilled that we can be together. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name's Phil, and uh, I get to serve as one of the pastors here. So it's a joy to be able to be in the room together. Uh, I was telling a few people in between the first service and this service that I didn't expect rain. Is anybody's app show rain this morning? I, I missed that. So, But we need it. How many people have some brown grass at their homes, right? Yes, right. Turn it into straw. So we need some of the rain, but the sun's coming back soon. Um, but so grateful that we can be together for worship. And I don't know if you sensed how God's working in this service, but just a powerful time in his presence, wasn't it? Can we just thank the worship team for leading us in that? I'm so glad it's more than just about the right chords and instruments, but the time and they put into preparing themselves to rehearse and then lead us in worship. Very, very thankful for that and for all those that play a part behind the scenes for it. Well, today we're in part two of a three-part series that we started last week entitled he said what? And so we're going to get back to that in just a moment here. But uh, as we do, just a, a refresher last week that we talked about this saying of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. We found it in chapter 15. It was one of those he said what phrases where he's talking to the Pharisees or religious leaders. We're using their names or that title a lot in these couple of weeks here. Um, because for them, the law of God and the precepts of God's word were all external. So we're going we're gonna to look back in to that today from a different vantage point, from a different passage. It may be one that's familiar to you, but the heart behind these three-part series is that Jesus was on the scene there in the Gospels, primarily in the Gospel of Matthew, where all three of these weeks will actually be preached out of, and some of the other Gospel accounts, Mark, Luke, and John, also parallel stories there. But we realize Jesus is confronting some things, um, some lies, some underlining uh, philosophies of the so-called religious leaders who were intended by God to be leading people into the freedom and understanding God's ways, but we're adding all this extra nonsense, if I could say it that way to you, uh, to, to what it means to live for God, to pursue him, to have relationship with him. So Jesus has to come and expose some of those lies and expose some of those things that they said we had to add on. He called them last week in the passage. Uh, he used the word hypocrites, like he's putting them on notice and a little bit on blast there. And, and not just name calling, but going, hey, there's something behind this that is out of step, out of alignment with the way that the father wants you guys and ladies to live. And so he's addressing that. And it's because of that, that we entitled this uh, series. He said, what? Because it's a little bit like, did Jesus really just say that? And if you were with us last week, we said it like this. You remember he said, what? But so I heard a few in there. Let's just all do it together for fun, right? Nobody's too school, cool for school today. So we're all going to do it on three. Ready? One, two, three. He said, what? 
right? And so if you thought it was last week only, it was this week, and guess what we're going to do next week? Yeah, but by then you guys are already experts at it. As a way of really helping us remember, did Jesus actually say that? So we pick up a passage in scripture today that's well-known. In fact, it's the most well-known, the most famous sermon ever preached by Jesus. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's the most famous sermon preached ever, uh, I would argue. And uh, it's just off the, sh- the sea, uh, the shore of Galilee, and he's up in this mountain region, and he's on, the, he's on the mountainside, if you can envision this, and the crowds are beginning to swell. He's been in public ministry, teaching and sharing and calling people to follow him, and crowds are gravitating towards him, as we see throughout the Gospels. The disciples are leaning into his teaching. Some of them have already committed their lives to following him and leaving their business, whether it was fishing or tax collecting, and they're going after Jesus. And so, so this excitement is in the air and people are, even if they're only questioning what this guy's all about, they're leaning in with a sensitive ear to hear what he's teaching. And so there's disciples there, there's crowds that are there, maybe people that were undecided of whether or not they would actually be a disciple. And the Pharisees are there as well. And these are the religious leaders of the day who again were entrusted with the the word of God, but were adding all this extra to it. And Jesus is for them laying out what kingdom living is all about. He's teaching the principles of God's word and talking specifically today, we're going to look at that it's much more about the heart than it is on what you see in the habits or what you see externally. And so as he's teaching through this and explaining them, there's a section that we know of called the Beatitudes where Jesus gives all these sayings that start with blessed are the poor in spirit or blessed are the meek, right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We know those as the Beatitudes. And so even in those few Beatitudes that he gives, he's flipping the script on what the culture, even the religious culture of that day said holiness looks like to what to teaching on what the Father actually requires for it to look like. So we're going to see in the section that we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 5 today, in the passage, Jesus starts with this statement, you've heard it said. In fact, we entitled this message part two this week today, just that, you've heard it said. Because he's going to say, hey, you've heard it said this way, or in other words, you've heard the law of God back In the book of Exodus, where Moses is given the law of the Lord, the Ten Commandments are part of that law, and he gives it to the people. And so they're taught this. It's down through the generations. It's been preserved, oral tradition. It's written in the Old Testament scriptures. But Jesus goes, you've heard it taught this way, but I tell you, and the but there is really important because what Jesus isn't doing is contradicting what's already been written. In fact, he's bringing further uh, revelation to it, and he's taking a fuller understanding and stretching it out before them. Now, what he does in this moment is really interesting. He's going to create a contrast that on the surface can look like a contradiction. But let me remind you that we believe that God's word is inerrant. That means without any mistakes. And so, so if there seems to be a contradiction as we read two parts of scripture, we've got to lean in a little bit further to understand the context, to understand what's being taught, whom the people are being taught that are part of that crowd. And so Jesus says, listen, you heard it taught this way, but I tell you to, 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 uh, to spend a little bit more time bringing life to it and revelation to it. So we're going to see a bunch of that. And it's important for us to understand that Jesus didn't come to cancel out the Old Testament law. In fact, a couple of verses that precede the passage we're going to look at here in 521, we see in verse 17 that Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or to cancel it out. In fact, I didn't come to do that. I came to fulfill the law. See, here's the thing about the law that's important to know, at least for our conversation today. And that's this. That the law in the Old Testament couldn't change anyone. Didn't have the power to do so. The, the law, if you remember what James writes about in the New Testament, he says the law served as a mirror and it just allows us to see where we fall short of God's standard. Only one person was ever able to fulfill all of the law and it was the very one who just gave us that word. It was Jesus himself. So he's saying, I haven't come to abolish or to cancel or to write out The law, I actually came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And here's a good little place for me to just insert what we're going to be doing through the summer in our summer sermon series that'll start in a couple of weeks from now, three weeks from now, actually, on the 30th of June, is we're going to be taking a walk through the little back part of the Old Testament. Just before you get to the Gospels, there's a section there that's called the Minor Prophets. 
Now, they're called the minor prophets because all the books are really short, not because they didn't have a major truth to share with us. And so we're entitled that series, Everyday Prophets, because there was something valuable for them to say in their day, and there's something valuable for us to teach today. And so everyday prophets that had a word, and here's the cool part, there's 12 of them, we only have nine weeks to do it, so we're going to we're going to get it in there right this summer. We're going to make sure it happens by before, before we get to Labor Day. And as we do, you're going to see one strong theme come to the surface. And it points us back to, the, to this sermon today. And here's, here's, here's the theme, is that every one of the prophets had a message to share that directed people to Jesus who would come years later. And so when Jesus is here on the Sermon on the Mount and he says, listen, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. What he's saying is I haven't come to cancel it out. What I'm coming to teach is a new standard of righteous living before God. So the Sermon on the Mount gets very real, very quickly. And he leans into them and helps them understand that, listen, the law is good. The law is proper. And only I can fulfill that because he came to live a perfect sinless life without any blemish. And understanding that, here's what we realize, that the law was there to just point us to what is true and to delineate and outline what holiness looks like, even though Jesus was the only one that can fulfill that. So we're going to dive into this together today, and we're going to look at a couple of, there's two of the six or seven, you've heard it said, phrases, but I tell you this, and here's the first one. So we're in Matthew chapter five. If you have your Bible with you, fantastic. If you want to look up on the screen, that's great as well. They're there for us. And here's what Jesus is saying. We're looking at the New Living Translation today, the NLT. So he says, you've heard it's, uh, that it was said to people long ago, he's talking about the Old Testament now, that you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, if anyone who says to a brother or sister, Racha, which is really a way of a derogatory term, it talks about somebody being empty headed, right? Kind of like a, a knucklehead if you want to dumb it down some and answerable to the court, right? So this name calling and anyone who says you fool, some versions translate that idiot will be in danger of the fires of hell. Right? He says, so, th so those words, those, those names that you would refer to somebody else, Jesus is saying come from a, from a bitter place in our heart. And he said, because of that, you're going to be held re responsible. Verse 23, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and I want you to see this, and we're going to bring this full circle as we close this out a little bit later on. Therefore, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift to the Lord. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're walking together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and then the officer may throw you in the prison. So Jesus is teaching here. It's a little bit of an interesting story, right? And it makes you step back and go, wait a second. What is he actually saying here? He, he says, hey, you guys have heard it taught long ago in oral tradition in the Old Testament scriptures this crowd would have known of well. And they said, they, they knew that, that God had commanded that they not murder, right? The actual committing of murder right? Of actually killing someone else or taking someone else's life. But Jesus is doubling down on it and saying, listen, but I'm saying it to you this way. That's true. But if you even have anger or hatred stored up in your heart towards someone else, you're in, you're in a very tough situation as well, because you're subject to judgment before God. And so that's pretty intense. I don't know what the crowds felt like that day. None of us were there, of course, right? But you can imagine the crowds and those that were well-versed in the Old Testament teachings, especially the religious leaders, these Pharisees that were standing there going, hold on a second. You're saying to me that even if I don't physically commit murder, but I think hatred or anger in my heart towards someone else, that I'm just as guilty. And Jesus is affirming that. And it's really interesting because what he says is, listen, even if you're coming to church that day, I'm going to paraphrase this and make it modern for us, relevant to us. He said, even if you're on the way to church that day, like you got yourself ready to come here to service today, you're coming to worship, you're coming to sing, you're coming to hear the word, maybe you're serving in one of the other services before or after. And so your day's planned out in that way. You're coming to serve, you're coming to offer yourself to God today. But there's something in your heart that has a grudge or some bitterness or unforgiveness towards a, another believer or a friend or family member that you haven't expressed or told them about, Jesus says it's important enough to leave your offering, forget coming, and go and make that thing right with them. 
But that's a big deal because for the religious leaders and even maybe some in the crowd that day or even the disciples that are new to Jesus' teachings are going, hold on, that's more important settling matters between me and another person than it is bringing my offering to God? And Jesus says, yes, because he links up the great commandment with the second greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love others as we love ourselves. And so Jesus is really pressing on this and he's getting at the, to the heart of it. This hatred is really this word anger. He's saying, if you leave that unchecked in your heart, what happens, and most of us know this, we've, we've lived life long enough, those of us that are adults in the room, even if you're in high school, where if you let anger fester in your heart, you know that it becomes toxic very quickly. And if left unrepented of, it can begin to destroy you. And although you may never physically commit murder, some of the things that scar our hearts and begin to live there, like bitterness, resentment, fractured friendships, broken relationships, envy, jealousy, pride, that we allow to live, which seems to be rent-free in our heart, ends up costing us way more than we want to pay. And so that's what Jesus is bringing to light here. He's saying, listen, yes, it's one thing, don't murder, but I'm telling you that even if in your heart you're thinking something towards another person, that God sees what's in your heart. And so your offering to him, your service to him, your song to him, your worship to him, to him, hey, he'd rather have that after you go make things right with another person. And I'm not going to tell you anything I don't know with this next statement, but for those of us, again, that have been around and lived enough life, we come to know that sometimes we hold things against other people that they don't even know about. And sometimes we have unforgiveness in our heart for something they've done to us, and we've never even had a conversation to enlighten them to what it was, right? Or there are times where we have to ask forgiveness for something we've done to someone else. And, and even though murder, physically acting out in that, has one consequence that's totally different from being angry with somebody in our heart, here's what Jesus understood and was teaching the crowd, that both of them are sinful and both separate you from God. If you physically murder someone, you should rightfully go away for a long time, right? There's a cost to pay. There's a punishment that's handed down. But you can be angry towards someone and murder them in your heart without many other people even knowing. But both of them are just as toxic. They're both sinful and separate us from a holy God. I tried to think of it in really practical terms the last few days, and I was thinking about this. If, if you grew up with some other siblings and some of you have them, or maybe you're a parent and you've had multiple kids or more than one kid, and, and you've been in a situation hearing these words or having said these words, like your parents telling you, hey, don't hit your brother or sister, right? How many ever heard that growing up, right? Yeah, all right, maybe the rest of us don't have siblings, right? Like, I mean, little spats. I have a sister that's two years younger than me, and I don't remember fighting a ton with her. We were into different things, right? And, um, but two years apart. And then, but when we do argue or fight or would, right, it was over those silliest little things. I, I I remember um, road trips on vacation. We would take a, a summer road trips. Most of them were driving. My dad never drove, so it was my mom. So my dad was sitting in the passenger seat, and we would fight getting into the car for who got the privilege to sit behind dad, just in case one of us were bad, and he would turn around and like reach for somebody's leg a little bit more strongly. Like You don't want to sit behind mom because he's going to get you, right? So there was a pre-argument before the argument just so that we were safe from correction, right? And so, and, and, and so the heart behind that whole thing is as you're correcting your kids or as you were corrected by parents growing up. The goal isn't for them to get you to not fight or argue or harm your sibling. The goal is for them to get you to not want to do that, right? I talk about this like this with chores all the time, right? I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, I want my son to finish out the, the assignments that we've given him in the house, whether it's taking out the garbage, recyclables, dishwasher, like he has some very menial tasks, right? But I don't want him to just do those things. I want him to want to do those things, to which he'll reply, why would I want to empty the dishwasher, right? So the heart behind this, what Jesus is saying, it's not what you do on the outside. It's a desire that starts on the inside. And, I, and so much so that 1 John echoes this truth. And he says this, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer. Now this is talking about within the community of the church, right? If you say, I love God, but I hate other believers, that person's a liar. He's saying it just as strong as Jesus is saying it, right? And if we don't love people how can, that we see, how can we love a God whom we cannot see? And he's given us this command that those who love God must also love their fellow believers. So it's this idea of murder, but Jesus is saying, even if it's anger in the heart. 
And then he bites off a second one. I told you there's like six or seven. We're just going to look at one more here because it's connected to the verses above. And he goes in verse 27 of Matthew 5 and he says, and you've also heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone that looks at another person lustfully has already committed adultery with them in their hearts. For if your right eye causes you to stumble, watch, this is like one of those he said what moments, right? Watch, he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. Some of us have read that meant so many times it doesn't even like impact us anymore, right? But listen to what he says. He said, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. Anybody ever thought about gouging out their eye or cutting off their hand, right? And, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away, for it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now listen, let me just state the obvious here, just so we're all on the same page. Jesus is not promoting self-pain or inflicting pain on himself. He's not even using this in a literal sense. And here's how we know that's true. He's talking about the heart behind it, that even though you may never commit adultery, that if you lust after someone or even something, it can create in your heart a separation very quickly from God. So if anything causes you to sin, get it out of the way. So Jesus isn't saying, hey, pluck out your eye or cut off your hand, because here's his reality. You can be missing a hand and an eye and still have lust in your heart. And that's what Jesus is driving at. It's always a condition of our hearts. And lust, if it's left unchecked and not repented of, can lure us into a whole bunch of other things. Now, Jesus is talking about it specifically back to the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament law. In the case of adultery here, which God had said very clearly, listen, any sexual encounter with somebody outside of the confines of marriage that the scriptures define as between one man and one woman for life is adulterous. It's outside of God's law because this was the way he was going to create families that would fill the earth. And so God makes that really clear. And Jesus is going, yes, that's true. And to take it a little further, if you have even lust building up in your heart, it will separate you from God. And, and I love what Paul says to his young apprentice, Timothy, who's a pastor in Ephesus. He says it like this, easy to remember where to find it. Second Timothy 2. 22. He says, Timothy, run from anything that stimulates useful, youthful lusts. Run from it. Listen, sometimes you and I are guilty of when lust comes up, and it could be a lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, something we want that's not ours, right? That we covet after, whether it's another person or a thing, right? And so what, what Paul's remedy is for this is don't sit around and talk to other people about it. Don't step back and analyze it and figure out, well, why did I actually feel that way? No, no, he says, run from this thing. Like, get out of Dodge. Just go. Flee from it. Run from it. But every time Scripture teaches us to run from one thing, it tells us to run towards something else. Listen to the rest of the verse. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace, and enjoy companionship. Here's, like, here, here's, what, here's what Paul's telling Timothy. Get a friend who loves Jesus and calls on the Lord with a pure heart. Listen, one of the remedies for lust that's building up in our hearts is to get around some other people that love Jesus, who are pursuing him, so we can run from those lusts together and pursue righteousness. Because here's what's true in the scriptures. Anytime you run from one thing, if you don't run to another thing, you'll run back to that first thing. And so Jesus is reinforcing that in this passage. And as we boil it down, I thought, what are, what are some ways that this text, these two issues that Jesus is dealing with that are really matters of the heart? He's talking about murder and adultery, but he's really dealing with anger and lust. But there are some foundational principles that really need to be extracted from the text that we're looking at today. And the first of the three is this, that God is way more concerned with our heart. He's way more concerned with our heart. Now, many of us know that and we understand it. Some of us have been doing this thing called Christianity for a long time, and it's incredible. And there's others of us that may be a little bit newer to the faith. Maybe you just recently have given your life to Christ, and that's wonderful as well. But God is never focused first on the outside. That's the fruit of a problem that's deeper because of a root that could be off. So he's always concerned about the heart and looking to make changes there as we'll give him permission and work with him. For the Pharisees, it was external conformity to everything on the outside so that you can convince other people that I've got it all together. And while none of us may ever wear a robe or a hat like the Pharisees have, we at times find ourselves being hypocritical in the sense of letting things live in our heart that we know are against the word of God, 
but cleaning ourselves up on the outside. So we can try to convince ourselves and even other people that we have it together and we're going after Jesus. All the while, God knows our heart and not in a way that condemns us, but in a way that wants to bring it to the light in our life so that he can cleanse us from those things, so that he can come and strengthen us. Jesus kind of puts the Pharisees in the verse before the ones we just looked at a little bit on blast again. Listen to what he says. He says, I tell you that unless the right, your righteousness, your holiness, he's speaking to the crowd, surpasses that of the Pharisees. <laughs> like, don't miss this here. The Pharisees are part of the crowd that day. And Jesus is going, unless your holiness surpasses their external show, you'll certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You wonder why the Pharisees got so upset with Jesus, right? I mean, he's just, he's just laying it on them thick because they had distorted so much of God's word. I go back to Chronicles, 1 Chronicles. There's two of them. 1 Chronicles 29, 17. Uh, the author says this, I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and you rejoice when you find integrity there. Man, listen, that is a beautiful verse in the scriptures that God rejoices when he examines our hearts and when he finds integrity there. You know what the root of integrity is? It's wholeness, right? Any math fans or math geeks in the house, right? I'm married to a math teacher, right? And you'll know that an integer is what? What kind of number? An integer is a what number? A whole number, right? It's a whole number. It's not fraction. There's no decimal there, right? An integer is a whole number, but but the opposite of that is a fraction. So we get integrity from that root word integer, which means wholeness or completeness. And the scriptures here are telling us that very truth, that God is examining the heart and he's looking for a heart that's whole. A heart that's whole, that's not divided, that's not split. One foot this way, one foot that way. One, one foot wanting to live for God, one foot wanting to please ourselves or others. And he knows our heart in such a way as to when he finds it and examines it, he rejoices like it makes the Lord glad when he finds integrity in our hearts. What an incredible verse. Here's the second foundational principle that I think is extracted from the surface. And this may be the most important, that God is not looking for real, just more religious activity. He's looking for a heart that's fully dedicated to him. I just need somebody to say amen so I know you're breathing today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Right? He's not just looking for an external show. And some of us live like this. Now, we would never say this. I've been guilty of this many times in the past, where it's like, I just got to do more to show God and others that I love him. I've got to sign up for not just one life group, but six. And then I'm going to lead two. And then I'm going to serve on eight ministry teams rather than on one. Like, listen, nobody's asking that of you. Sometimes we add all this extra religious activity on ourselves so we can prove to us and maybe to others that we love God. God's not looking for that. He's looking for a heart that's fully committed to him. And that's why what Jesus is emphasizing, no, holiness is, is, is starts inside of our hearts. And holiness is what we've already been talking about, is this idea of setting ourselves apart to God. That's holiness. And some of us think this in our minds that, man, holiness can never be achieved. I can never be holy. No, six times in scripture, the Bible tells us, God says, I am holy, therefore be holy. And if he asks us to do it, how many believe it's possible? With the help of his Holy Spirit, he renews us. And so holiness isn't an outward show. It's not comparing your growth spiritually to someone else's. Come on, you with me today? Holiness is going, Lord, check my heart. Is it whole before you? And if there's anything in there that doesn't belong, anger, lust, or any other thing that separates me from you, bring it into the light so that I can live wholehearted before you. Another incredible verse in 2 Chronicles 16, I quoted this last week, we didn't have it on the screen, so I want to bring it back to us this week, is this, that the eyes of the Lord, listen to how powerful this is, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to find a heart who's strongly committed to Jesus, and then he comes and strengthens it. I believe that was true back then, and I believe it's still true now. God doesn't change, his character and his nature is the same, and that he's still looking on the earth today for a heart that's fully committed to him. And when he finds those hearts, he strengthens them. He makes them even stronger so that they can be more and more like his son, Jesus. It's easy for us to fool other people. It's easy for us to want to take on more what I would call religious activity to try to prove to ourselves or others that we're close to God. But he's always looking for a heart that's just surrendered, devoted, and committed to him. And then here's the third and final 
foundational principle that I think we pull out of the text. A true righteousness is heart-centric. It's not habit-centric. True righteousness before God. I like the definition of righteousness. Here's one of them. It's God's right way of living. So righteousness is a big word. It's a churchy word. It's a Bible word. But the way for us to break that down or summarize it is it's God's right way of living. That he has a standard. And we can live that way as the Holy Spirit empowers us. But it's important for us to remember that it's not based on our habits. It's based on our heart. It's the difference between the letter of the law that the Pharisees gave their lives to or the spirit of the law that Jesus was talking about. For for the Pharisees, murder was the letter of the law. Jesus says that the spirit behind the law is don't even let anger into your heart. For the Pharisees, the letter of the law was do not commit adultery. Jesus says that's true, but the spirit behind it is also don't let lust rule in your hearts. It will destroy you. He's not looking for us to live like the Pharisees, but to make this ongoing, growing commitment. First Chronicles, I told you there's a lot of verses in Chronicles today. There's some powerful words. This is King David writing to his son Solomon. I want you to see this in 28 verse 9. He says, Solomon, my dear son, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with, say the next two words with me, wholehearted devotion. And then watch this. He leans in a little further. He says, serve him with wholehearted devotion and a willing mind Why? Because the Lord searches every heart. He understands every desire and every thought. Now that verse is not in the scriptures to scare us. I remember hearing that when I was a kid or something close to that and thinking God's watching every move. And he is. But he's not watching to condemn you. He's watching to refine you. He's watching to place conviction on the areas that are out of line with his word because he knows that when we step out of what's best for us, we bring harm into our lives. And he's designed and detailed to us in the scriptures a certain way for us to live. And when we do that, then the blessing of God is on our life. Can I just be vulnerable for with you a moment? Listen, there's a lot of times sitting across from somebody in just a pastoral counseling session and people say, listen, Phil, I want God's blessing on my life. Like, okay, well, we're going to pray for that. Tell me about how you're functioning right now in whatever area it is. And you'd be surprised at how many times people want God's blessing, but they don't want to follow his game plan. They want the blessing and the favor of the Lord, but they don't want to follow any of the ways that he's detailed for us to live. And I just want to remind all of us, myself as even as leaving my mouth, that we can't ask and pray for God's blessings while negating his word. It doesn't work that way. His favor's on us as our hearts are aligned to his truth as he explains it to us in the scriptures. So David's saying to his son Solomon, just know that he's looking for wholehearted devotion. So let me summarize this thing, bring it all together, and then we're going to tie it together with prayer. Jesus is dealing with these two issues, murder and adultery, but for him it's about anger and lust. Because he knows that both of those, if we allow them to sit in our hearts, will be toxic for us. They're nothing but spiritual poison. And when we ignore them, here's what happens. Spiritual thoughts, or I'm sorry, sinful thoughts that sit there for a while in our heads and in our hearts that aren't dealt with. When they come in, it's just a thought. But if we allow it over time, it gives birth to a desire. And the desire after time can grow into a sinful habit that can grow into a sinful lifestyle. And by Jesus exposing the Pharisees, he's saying, listen, it's not just murder and adultery externally. It's anger and lust on the inside that will start with a thought, will grow into a desire, will become a habit, and then become a lifestyle. And you'll find yourself so far away from God's intended plan for your life. So then the question we need to ask is, how do we, how do we remedy these things? How do we get these things in alignment? Because the word of God says in Proverbs 4, a well-known verse, says, above everything else, guard your hearts. But I want you to see the next few words, for it determines the course of your life. And if all you do is fill your heart with anger and lust and greed and pride and resentment, and you can fill out a whole list, and that's going to determine a direction of your life that I would guess this morning you really don't want to go. And so with this anger and lust, there's some antidotes for it. There's a solution. And the way that we defeat anger is through reconciliation. 
You might think, hold on a second, that seems strange. It was Jesus's words. We read it a little while ago. He said, if you have your offering ready to worship the Lord with, leave it there and go be reconciled to your brother or sister. The way that we deal with anger is by making it right with the person we're angry towards. I mentioned to us earlier, sometimes we're bitter towards someone and they don't even know what we've done. Or sometimes you've sinned against someone else and you need to go and ask for forgiveness. Now listen, how they respond is on them. If you're the one asking for forgiveness, your heart is being made clean as you're genuinely asking for forgiveness. Someone can still choose to not forgive you. That's between them and the Lord. But to follow Jesus's blueprint here, it's, hey, I'm going to leave my offering to God and I'm going to go make things right between me and my brother or my sister. And then the answer or the way that we defeat lust is with removal. It's with removal. It's making sure that it doesn't even have a place to hang out. When the thought comes in, the thought may not be sinful at the moment, but when we let that temptation play out and act out on it, that's when it becomes sinful. That's when it becomes devastating. That's when it separates us from God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes it this way, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and spirit as we continue to strive for holiness out of reverence or worship from God. Right? So, so lust... When it creeps into our hearts, we deal with it or defeat it. We're victorious over it by removing it. I love how David prayed this in Psalm 51. And I say prayed it and didn't write it because it was from the depths of his heart. He said, God, create a clean heart in me, oh God, and and, and renew a right spirit within me. What a prayer to pray. It's a prayer that all of us can steal from David and apply to our lives. Lord, just, just make my heart clean before you. I want to be right before you. I don't want to have to live with any of the thoughts or any of the resentment or any of the bitterness. And so let me put it to us in question form today and make it really practical for us. Where are you trying to keep God's commands externally, but closing your eyes spiritually to the intention behind them? Is there any place in your life? I'm not asking you to stand and tell us your answer out loud. I'm just asking you to allow the Holy Spirit to bring it to the surface right now of your heart. Is there any place where you've been worshiping God externally, but you haven't let him penetrate and deal with what's in your heart, whether it's anger or lust or something else? Because both of those sins, anger and lust, if undealt with, will rot away at you. And so there may be somebody, here's here's where it's practical, in this room or online, that today you know your next step is you've got to call somebody who you've just had a beef or a disagreement with, And it's been eating away at you because you haven't made things right. Whether it's you that needs to ask forgiveness or whether you need to make them aware of something they've done to hurt you. And so I I really sense, I've been thinking about this as I've been praying this week. I just felt like the Lord was prompting me that this week in all of our services, there's going to be people in the room that need to respond to this. I don't know who you are and it's not for me to know, but I just want to challenge you that you don't have to carry the anger and the hurt and the resentment with you anymore. Go make it right, and Jesus will help you. And if it's lust, if it's lust of the eyes, like the Bible talks about, the lust of the flesh, if it's wanting something that you know you can't rightfully have, ask the Lord to come and remove even the desire for it and ask him to come and purify every place in your heart that's dirty. He'll create in you a clean heart, and he'll renew a right spirit in you if you'll let him. Amen? Would you bow your heads? I want to pray for us. Jesus, we love you and we love your word. Father, we're so grateful for your willingness to send your son, not only to teach the truths that we looked at today, but to literally give his life in our place. And we're thankful for that. In a moment, we're going to have an opportunity. If you're here and you want to receive Christ as your savior today, make him the Lord of your life in a moment. But in this moment, God, I pray for those of us that are already said yes to Jesus. We're following you, Lord. And we came today and we maybe didn't expect this part of the He Said What series to, to hit us the way it's landing right now. And some of us, God, are, are, are sensing, we're, we're, we're feeling in, in, in just in our hearts, in our spirits today. This, in a good way, it, it feels good. In another way, it feels a little bit nagging that you're exposing some areas where we've just let some things linger and they're, and they're hurting us. They're killing us from the inside out. Anger, lust, greed, pride, whatever it is. 
And so God, today we surrender those things to you. I pray for the person that resonated with what I mentioned a moment ago. He says, I've got to go make some things right between a family member, a friend, a coworker, somebody in my life group, whatever it is. I've, I've hurt them or they hurt me and we have to have a conversation about it. Lord, I pray that you would give them the boldness and the courage to walk that thing out, that there would be freedom in their lives because that's the spirit of what you were saying was behind do not murder. You don't want us to live with any animosity towards anyone else. And Lord, for those that are in the room that have just allowed lust to come in and take up residence and camp out in our hearts, whether it's the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, having something or wanting something that we can't have, Lord, I pray that you would uproot that from our hearts today, that we would surrender those things to you, that we wouldn't carry them into another week, that we wouldn't bring them back with us next time we worship here. Lord, I believe you're doing a deep work in your people now and help us to respond promptly and thoroughly to what you're asking us to do. We thank you for it, Jesus. As heads are bowed just for a moment longer, give an opportunity before I turn this back to Pastor Dave for, for those that are here today. And maybe you just, you're just far from God today. You say, what do you mean by that? You just, you just know that even with what we talked about for the little bit of time we shared this sermon together, you... You know, your heart is not in alignment with what God is teaching us. And you might feel a little bit of sorrow about that. You might feel a little broken about that. And I just want to invite you to embrace that. The Lord's not looking to make you feel bad. The Lord's looking to make you clean. And he does that by the Bible word for it is conviction. Basically, he makes you aware of your sin. And he does that with kindness. Scripture tells us that God draws us to salvation through his kindness. And so it's kind of the Lord today to address what's in your heart so that he can save you from it. He loves you that much that he would have those words be expressed and shared today. So if you're here today or you're online and you say, Phil, that's me. I'm just far from Jesus today and I want him in my life. I want to surrender control. I want my heart to be wholly committed to him like we talked about. I'd love to pray for you. I'm going to do it quickly. I'm not going to ask you to stand or come forward. But if that's you today, you want Jesus to move into your life. You want him to forgive you of your sins. You want him to be the one that calls the shots. As heads are bowed, would you just lift up your hand long enough for me to see it? I want to include you in this prayer. Yeah, all the way in the back. God bless you. Awesome. Awesome. Anyone else? I'm just going to wait just a moment and give you an opportunity to respond. Again, if that's you online, let our team know. Our moderators are there to help you, to pray with you, give you some next steps. Father, I thank you for those that are saying yes to you in this moment. I saw at least one in the room. Maybe there's others online. But as we're making a conscious decision in this moment to say, Lord, I need you in my life, I pray, God, that you would just, you would come in and forgive them of their sins. The Bible says it's the word repentance. We, we say we're sorry for what we've done against you. So if that's you today, you're saying that, you raise your hand, or maybe you didn't, but you're saying, man, I want to make a decision. You, you could say that to Jesus right now. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I recognize that what you did on the cross was in my place, that you paid for all my sins on the cross. And I put my hope and trust in you for all of that. And Lord, we're asking that your spirit would come quickly flooding into those hearts. Would you give them this beautiful assurance that we get when we walk into relationship with you, an assurance that says we don't have to earn it or pay for it. It's by your incredible grace that we're saved. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.